Isn't it a beautiful day outside? Spring is finally here. Does anybody have any flowers coming up in their garden? Yes, my crocuses are blooming and, uh, and I have some tulips going, like the one that's uh, that, that's in my garden. So lovely, I love, I love the beginning of springtime. I love being outside and celebrating the goodness of God. Well, outside is exactly where um, our leader, our hero for the day is found, David. David spends a lot of time outdoors because he is a shepherd. Um, now, over the last several weeks, we have been seeing how God has developed and used the gifts and talents of other leaders up to our point in the story. We've heard stories of Moses, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We've heard stories of Rahab and Ruth and the judges and how they all turn God's people back to God. They run away and they turn them back to God. And the prophets have started to rise up and they turn everyone back to God and talk about where God's heart is, right? And with the rise of the prophets, we've come to the time of the kings. Now last week, Larry shared with us that King Saul was chosen, why? Because he was the tallest, that's right, because he was tall, because he was handsome, because he was strong, he had military might. That's right. Good memory. <laughs> and we also heard how he erected a statue of himself in Israel's midst so they could worship their new ruler, their new king. And so, it is not surprising that God sent Samuel to anoint someone else, even while Saul was still living. So now we come to today's story, which begins in the house of Jesse, where the prophet Samuel has been sent. Now Jesse is proud to show off his six other sons and to parade them in front of him and say, oh, this one, this one, he's so handsome and he's so strong and he'd be a great military leader. And Samuel, well, we're told, is impressed. But not so with God. God says, there's someone else. Go to the fields. That little boy over there, that little runt of the litter, that's who I've chosen. That's, that's who has the heart that I want. So far from being a daydreamer, young David is well-versed in all the duties of a shepherd. He has experience being a midwife for the sheep, for caring for the whole group, watching, out, watching over the whole flock, seeking out the strays and protecting them from the lion and the bear. He milks the ewes, he helps his feed his family by making cheese, and he works hard to heal sick and injured lambs. This description is starting to sound a little familiar, yes? He's a good shepherd. Now our story isn't clear about how much time passes, but sometime after he is anointed by Samuel, he is called away from his shepherding duties to play delivery boy. It's kind of a step up in the world, apparently. He hires out his position, takes bread and wheels of cheese, and goes to the military. And he, he, de he thinks that they're going to be fighting, but he finds them in a holding pattern of fear. He decides that the enemy's champion, Goliath, is no different than the bears and the lions that he has fought in the wilderness. And so he volunteers, this yay big child volunteers himself to become Israel's champion. Now after slaying the supremely large Philistine, young David is brought into the king's court where he begins his apprenticeship under Saul's tutelage. There he becomes like a new son to Saul and he bonds really closely with Saul's biological son, Jonathan. From the fields with the sheep and the quail, David brings his love of music and poetry, and he brings it into the king's presence. Presumably there in the king's courts, he learns military strategy and his letters. He studies the history of Israel. And in that time of learning, his love of God just grows, and his love of God's people grows exponentially. And as he grows in strength and years, the people of Israel fall in love with him. 
this new young leader that God has raised up in their midst. They accepted him in their heart as their upcoming king, and they even praise him with song in the streets. Let's read from 1 Samuel. As they were coming home, when David returned from killing the Philistine, the women came out of all the towns of Israel, singing and dancing to meet King Saul with tambourines, with songs of joy, and with musical instruments. And then the women sang to one another as they made merry. Saul has killed his thousands, and David his ten thousands. Now Saul was very angry, for this saying displeased him. He said, they have ascribed to David ten thousands, and to me they have ascribed only thousands. What more can he have but the kingdom? So Saul eyed David from that day on. The next day, an evil spirit from God rushed upon Saul, and he raved within his house while David was playing the lyre as he did day by day. Saul threw his spear in his hand, took his spear in his hand and threw it, for he thought, I will pin David to the wall. But David eluded him twice. Saul then was afraid of David, because the Lord was with David, but he had departed from Saul. So Saul removed David from his presence and made him commander of a thousand. David marched out and came in, leading the army. David had success in all his undertakings, for the Lord was with him. When Saul saw that he had great success, he stood in awe of him. So while the people of Israel fall in love with David, Saul's schizoid tendencies grow more and more violent and angry. David's kinship with Jonathan leads him to the knowledge that Saul is now out to take his life, and so David flees, and he takes people with him who are his supporters. And they go to, go to Philistine territory, enemy territory, and they find a place to hide near a cave. And David is so afraid, but he trusts in God. And so he takes up his stringed instrument. And begins to pray. My soul cried out. Well, we are told that Saul is in hot pursuit, and while he is in hot pursuit of David, he takes a break, takes himself away from 
the rest of his militia and goes into a cave right near where David is. He just needs to answer the call of nature, as we all do. Now David's supporters urge him to go into the cave and to take Saul's life once and for all and just rise up and become the new king this way. We'll support you, they say. And so he sneaks, he sneaks into the cave and he raises his knife and cuts off a piece of Saul's robe. And Saul goes out and he sees David's militia and his militia and they're all gathered there at the front of the cave and David comes out says, my lord, my lord, the king. And he submits to the king. Let's read from 1 Samuel again. David said to Saul, why? Why do you listen to the words of those who say David seeks to do you harm? This very day your eyes have seen how the Lord gave you into my hand in the cave. Now some urge me to kill you but I spared you. I said, I will not raise my hand against my Lord, for he is the Lord's anointed. See my father, see the corner of your cloak in my hand. By the fact that I cut off the corner of your cloak and did not kill you, you may now know for certain that there is no wrong or treason in my hands. I have not sinned against you, even though you are hunting to take my life. We are told that Saul repents of his intended evil, declaring in the midst of the whole people that David is more righteous than he. Now sometime later, around the same time, the prophet Samuel returns to the scene, predicting the downfall of the king, King Saul, and critiquing the direction that Saul's leadership has taken Israel. Saul has become puffed up with pride He has turned a large portion of Israel away from God to worship other gods, and he has almost completely lost his mind. His heart, Saul's heart, which had once been directed by humility and service of the Lord, has now grown dark, proud, and violent in nature. Through Samuel, the Lord expresses deep grief over this situation. And it's only a short while later that we find Saul and his son Jonathan in the midst of battle with the Philistines, and they are both slain. At the loss of his dear friend and his king, David grieves together with God. And after a time of mourning, he steps up into the leadership that God has anointed him for in his youth. It is never easy to take on the mantle when someone who wore it before you ended their service in darkness and chaos, and corruption. Now remember last week, um, the Ark of the Covenant was taken into enemy territory during the early days of Saul's reign. Well, now it is important, it is imperative for David to go and retrieve it, to bring the presence of the Lord, the virtual presence of the Lord, back into the midst of Israel. And so, early in his kingship, the Ark of the Covenant is brought back into Israel's midst. The Lord is with them once again. And it is, the Ark is brought back with a large parade, lots and lots of singing and dancing. We even find David stripped down, almost naked, and dancing wildly in the streets. This is just utter submission and joy and excitement that the Lord is back. David's love of music and dancing that he learned in the fields in in his youth now sets an example for all of Israel in how to worship God. He knows that he is not the center of attention, so that is why he removed all of his outer garments. He threw off his royal robes and led the people with dancing, tambourines, lyres, harps, all kinds of instruments. When he was young, David taught Israel to sing and dance in the worship of Yahweh once more. The people repented from the ways that they had gone with Saul. Under David's leadership, Israel remembers the name of the Lord Almighty. And so God promises that David's name will be remembered. Let's read from 2 Samuel. I took you from the pasture, 
from following the sheep to be prince over my people Israel. And I have been with you wherever you went and have cut off your enemies before you. I will make for you a great name, like the names of the great ones of the earth. And I will appoint a place for my people Israel. I will plant them so that they may live in their own place and be disturbed no more. I will give you rest from all of your enemies. Moreover, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house. When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring after you, who shall come forth from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be a father to him, and he shall be a son to me. So our chapter in the story ends with a promise of everlasting heritage. We catch a clear glimpse of the coming Christ. Our eyes are turned towards the one day when the true king, the great shepherd, the king of kings, will come into Israel's midst, drawing them close to the heart of God. Now David was not perfect, and we'll hear more about that next week. But even in his imperfect leadership, David becomes an archetype, an image or reflection of the coming one, His deep relationship with the Lord and his deep faith are seen clearly through his music, his poetry, his song. Even though he has many other gifts, and even though he is a strong military leader, his worship leadership is what really sets him apart. That, more than anything else, is what Israel needed in order to ignite their passions for God once more, to remember who they were whose they were. And that is something that he learned out in the fields, from the birds of the air, in the birthing of lambs, and through his interaction with the lion and the bear. So what about us? What are the things that have been stirring in us from the time of our youth? What gifts and talents do we bring to our families, to our work, to our church? Where might God be leading us in the future, as individuals and as a community of faith? I pray that we all take time to reflect on what it means to be an image of the coming Christ. May the Spirit help us in this endeavor. Amen.